Welcome and thanks for filling in the room. <coughs> uh, I wasn't expecting so many spectators, so it's a pleasant surprise. And uh, if you have any questions during the presentation, please interrupt. Don't wait for the end because time might not be enough for that. So let's interrupt immediately and then discuss the topic because it might interest others as well. All the slides are already in the speaker deck and probably the organizers will provide the slides as well. So no need to make any kind of notes or anything like that. Uh, well, briefly, as it says, I'm the developer experience lead at the moment. So responsible for anything related to developers and how they how easily they can use our APIs and other tools, API docs, developer portal, whatever is included in the developer experience in anyone's mind. So that's the whole thing is my responsibility in the platform of trust. I'll, in a few slides, I'll tell you a few words about the platform itself. But I landed in the position after working for it for three years. This is my dream position now. This is what I've been looking after and aiming for. And now I actually got to do what I love to do. And uh, it's hard to actually keep from myself to work over time. So it, that's the only problem for me, work too much. Of course, the seven kids at home make a mandatory break for working. So they, they often require some kind of attention. But why the developer experience in general is important? Uh, I discussed a lot with business oriented and business people and uh, that's why I always show some kind of numbers and losses. If your API developer experience or platform developer, developer experience is shit, you're going to lose a lot of money and you're going to lose a lot of opportunities. And uh, this is coming from uh, the number of annual loss of 85 billion in a year. It's coming from a, a survey or research done by uh, one of the biggest API-driven companies in, in payment sector, Stripe, and they're some kind of research company partner. And they came to a number that uh, due to some kind of bad code, whatever that might mean, that's a bit vague, you would lose in global level about that much money. So that's one of the reasons, the noble reason to focus on uh, making your developer experience as good as possible. So you don't make any kind of annual losses. So I chose because I love movies as well and uh, Batman movies is one of my favorites, all time favorites and the Joker is there a good, good guy for me. Uh, interesting guy, uh, so it's, it, I came to the idea that hey, if your bad, bad developer experience really causes losses, then it's the choker of the API economy because you're burning money at the same time. Like in the movie, one of the movies, choker was uh, standing next to a big pile of dollars, billions of dollars, and it was burning. So that's exactly what's happening at the moment, if you don't care about your developer experience. The other noble reason to focus on developer experience is the lack of developers at the moment. A lot of good developers are required in different companies, at least in Finland, a lot. But we need more developers and uh, if you provide tools that are shitty developer experience, it means that the developers actually spend more time in, in getting and using your APIs or your platform and it's harder to use your tools. The harder it is, the longer it takes and more experienced developer you have to have to make good use of your tools. So if you provide a good developer experience, less experienced developers are able to use it more efficiently and, uh, and provide or build applications or solutions on top of it faster. So in a way, if you are providing any kind of APIs or platforms and you take care of your developer experience, you're doing your part in, in solving the problem of lack of developers. 
another noble thing. It sounds good. Probably look true at some point. And the third one is related that if you if your tools are easy to use, the developer experience is enjoyable and everything works, you're able to produce applications and solutions faster to the market. And this is important for the business people. So reduce time to market for the applications. If you need to spend a week in learning the API from a PDF file uh, versus situation that you have a, a NPM uh, package ready to be installed with the package manager and it's a library which actually is easy to use, you can build the solution in a week or in a day. Which one do you want to do? Learn the PDF file or use the tool needed. That's the difference in a, in a black and white situation. So, it significantly reduces time to market for the, or time to, time to market time span for the applications and solutions. And as you know, by the way, hands up if you feel that you are a developer in some sense or you have been a developer. Okay, most of you, good. Uh, you are lazy bastards. <laughs> Good, good developer is a lazy bastard because you don't want to do anything more than you need to do and you don't want to do re repeat, repeat same stuff again and again so if you make it easy for the developer to use your API or your platform you're making the lazy developer bastards more happier it's a good thing in my opinion Yes, this is the landscape that I work in. Uh, this is the, in a one picture, some elements of the platform in, where, where the developer experience is my problem and my field. So we have uh, data providers who actually have some kind of data, for example, sensor information about the buildings and the temperature, CO2, electricity consumption, water consumption, whatever you want. That kind of, they have some kind of data somewhere and it's in local data format, obviously. And uh, we provide tools then to integrate that data to us and harmonize the data. So that when the application builder, another developer, is consuming the data coming from various sources, he or she is facing only one standard format of the data. And our task is to combine the data and the developers. So it's this green line is my responsibility and it's the only only track that actually goes through the whole stack. So my, my position is probably the hardest one. But I love it. Because I love, I love being with the developers. I used to, I'm, I'm trained by the developers, open source community. All the skills that I've learned, they have taught me past 10, 20 years all the skills that I've learned. So I want to put my effort in, in building the best possible platform for you to consume. I don't, I'm not gonna go all the elements that actually are there and uh, some of them are missing, but the point is that yes, our platform just connects the data to the developers and harmonizes the data in the between, so it's easier to build uh, replicatable solutions on top of the data instead of building all the solutions again and again and again. That again, that's also reducing time to market span again for the applications. All right, uh, my goal uh, as the lead of developer experience, provide uh, easy access to data and efficient tools to foster creation of applications, in a sense. To make the world more developer friendly, yes, and improve the developer experience in everything, basically. That's the noble goal of everything that I do. That's the, that's the core principle to make the world developer friendly. Whatever I do, that's the thing that I need to think about first. And whenever that is achieved, then normally the business side is happy as well because it makes it faster, easier, and so on. We can debate for a week what is a good developer experience for APIs. There are some elements that are included in normally in a good developer experience. The API is built for purpose. It creates some kind of value. 
It has a reason why it has been built. Uh, public sector in Finland is filled with examples when this principle is not applied. There are APIs that doesn't have any kind of purpose. It's just built because. It doesn't solve any kind of problem. There's no use case, there's no business case, there's nothing. It's just there. That's not a good, good thing to do when you're in a business. Possibly possible in the private sector, sorry, in public sector. Well, it has to be reliable. If you're gonna build an application on top of some, someone's API, you need to be pretty sure that it's gonna be there and it's gonna work pretty the same way. It's gonna respond uh, in 200 milliseconds and it's gonna be there 99.9 .9 of the time and so on. So it's reliable, you can count on it. It has a low learning curve, so it doesn't require that you use a weak for the PDF file to actually learn how it works. It gives you examples, guides, and uh, code snippets and everything else. It's based on self-service. You're not gonna you're not gonna be asked to send email to someone to get an API key. That's a good example. You get it out of the box, and everything else comes out of the box. You don't need to contact any kind of customer service. You get it immediately. Possibly if you keep the credit card at some point. It has an up-to-date documentation and it's accurate. This is the most common reason to actually seek for alternatives. If your documentation sucks, the developer is gonna find another one. If it's possible and the developer is not given that you need to work on this API. So if you don't have any kind of resources for anything else, focus on your documentation and make sure that it's up to date. It's easy to produce documentation that is great, it has a lot of details and it's good, it has, a full of, it, it has uh, code examples for 10 languages once. What happens when something changes in your backend? You need to rebuild everything. How to make that Efficient and easy to make sure that your end result, the documentation is always up to date. Possibly reduce some of the features, some of the elemental code examples, but make sure that it's always up to date. So most likely you need to automate the stuff anyway. That's one of the topics I'm gonna discuss today. And then you need to have some kind of support. You need to have some kind of email or some kind of phone number or something as a backup. And uh, the developer's manager probably might have need for this kind of support number or something to discuss something. I don't know. But it has to be there some, in some form. The less this function is used, the better your rest of the elements probably are. So measuring the amount of how, how many support calls or contacts you get is a good measure. Are you succeeding in building the developer experience? And it has to be, well, this is more like a, when you have multiple APIs. It, come, it becomes a, a family of APIs. Then those have to be unified and consistent. They behave exactly the same. They use same kind of parameter names. They, they have same kind of uh, path uh, or, or sorry, endpoint uh, path structure and everything else. So they are easy to learn. You learn one and the rest of the APIs are familiar to you already. And you can have plenty of other attributes for a good developer experience. But in a nutshell, do we agree on this one? Hands up. At some level, good. Most of you agree. But in reality, uh, again, the lead was to make the the world more developer friendly and uh, better and so on. But uh, in reality, during the past months uh, when I've been working in the platform and leading the developer experience, I've noticed that basically my practical task is to maximize the positive external developer experience while without killing the internal developer experience. Because those two are th different things. Most of the presentations tell you how, what this should be, and that we just discussed. That's the, that's the vision, that's the aim goal, that's something you're probably never gonna achieve. Because 
you need to think about your own developers and how they work and what kind of limitations they have or what kind of preference they have. And then you need to balance between these two. And uh, this is something that I actually noticed uh, that no one in the presentations or conferences haven't been discussing this kind of dual side of the developer experience. It's always a coin. Or if you're bowling to that one, you're showing your bottom to that one. So this is the biggest learning during the past six months. And uh, I'm going to give you three examples. There's more, but three of the examples. Well, APIs are important for our platform. And needless to say, and uh, we are API driven, everything is built on top of the APIs. And also the, the, uh, in the survey that I mentioned, there's Stripe and Harris, which actually contains uh, 1,000 developers and 1,000 C-level exe executives. And the developers actually said that the API-based services are probably the fourth important technology that affects the company today. So you need to focus on APIs and their developer experience heavily. Well, I mentioned that uh, as a developer experience lead, you, you need to worry about the developer portal and the API docs and, and so on. But it's not only that. Here's a few items that are my responsibility. So it's a big thing, actually, you need to worry about and think about. API docs, not naturally. Yes, API management is there. That's my problem as well. How to make that happen? It's related to the API keys and everything else. So it's suitable that it comes to me. Then I also need to worry about the API design guide because we have a plenty of APIs and that family of APIs is growing. So we need to have some kind of guide that tells all the developers that this is how these elements should be implemented. So that it becomes consistent and it's easier to maintain and easier to update and so on easier to understand. Well, then these are platform-related elements, so how to create uh, data products with the APIs and uh, analyze usage of APIs, but also the behavior of the developers in the developer portal and the API docs as well. So what are the customer paths developers are taking and which of the paths are not working? Analyzing your behavior in our tools is one of the key elements. Well, a lot of other things. Again, the, the examples I'm going to show you are just tiny bits in, in this kind of puzzle that I live in. Those three cases are uh, architecture versus exposed APIs, uh, RAML versus open API spec, and then Postman versus Insomnia. You probably, if you're not familiar with all the terms, don't worry, you'll, you'll get it anyway in a few seconds. So the first one, uh, architecture versus a, uh, exposed APIs. Our architecture is based on, on microservice principles. So there's a lot of APIs, a lot of internal APIs. Everything is basically run on APIs. Small things that uh, functions that happen there are, are API driven. And uh, it resulted to quite a big list of different APIs. And uh, in, I think it was uh, February, I started a discussion in Slack with the tech team lead, which, which was also acting as an architect. And uh, we had a week-long discussion in one of the channels about their understanding of APIs and uh, what I actually want to expose, and that these two are not the same. It took a week to debate that you can't just push the APIs as they are developed internally to the outside world, because it doesn't make any sense for the consumer. They don't want uh, microservice APIs. They want some kind of logical combined sets of uh, endpoints that actually do some kind of solve some kind of problem. For example, if you want to create a data product, it contains five API calls. Their solution would have been expose all these, and then the developer would actually build the, the, in the code level that they actually 
call this API, then you have to call this one, then you have to call this one, and then that one, and finally you get to do this, and then you're all done. And all these would be different APIs in API documentation. So learning all these by one would actually make it harder for the developer. My solution was that we actually combine these endpoints at the exposure layer. So put some kind of broker APIs and product API endpoints next to each other and rename it possibly so it makes a, a set. But it took a week. And at that point, I understood that there are internal and external developer experience. And then I started to see these all other the elements as well. Okay, then we used the basically HA proxy and some API management solution to solve this. Raml Open API. You know that Open API spec is the one that rules the, or dominates the world. In all the presentation, everyone is praising for the API, Open API specification. And that is sort of expected. Yes, it is expected. But it didn't make any sense for the internal experience to use the Open API spec because some kind of reuse inefficiency and, uh, uh, and uh, things that actually make our CD, CI CD process more efficient, they prefer to use the RAML. Despite the fact that it's fading ecosystem, despite the fact that it's not possible to use in our API documentation generation directly, and on the other side you have to grow an ecosystem and everything else. The solution was that actually, I told them that use the fucking RAML, fine, I'll make a tool to handle the gap between the slate and the RAML so that we get the API documentation out automatically. And well, that is, this is basically the process that we actually did. Six RAML files coming in, then our code examples related to the endpoints, there's like 40 plus of those. Then uh, RAMLs are converted to open API spec with a custom tool which actually injects the, the code examples to the slate formatted markdown. And then with that tool, we actually push out the static HTML, which is then actually pushed to GitHub back and published automatically out there. So whenever something changes here, this is rebuilt again. It's not perfect, but it actually, it, it makes sure that it's always up to date. Then the uh, third one, Insomnia and Postman. Who uses Postman? Hands up. A lot. Who uses Insomnia? Good, 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 good. Uh, again, these are for testing the APIs, basically. You can use it in different internally or externally or whatever you want, but it's in your desktop. You can run the API calls there and see the responses and do your own stuff and learning and everything else. Pretty similar tools look pretty much the same, uh, provide the same uh, capabilities to test any kind of APIs. Okay? You would say that you would probably assume that we would go for Postman. Yes, that's what I suggested to them. But no, we want Insomnia. They prefer to use that one because Insomnia addresses the bugs and feature request in GitHub faster. And actually, this is the biggest reason why they hate Postman, because Postman doesn't handle the host's file correctly. It made them impossible to use it in their internal work. So they look for an alternative again. They found insomnia. Let's use that one. Fine. And uh, according to them, their, their experience, it's easier for the new, new users and even for the experienced users. It has less features, but those are more important features that you actually need. So my, my learning from six months is that internal development experience is more important in the beginning of when you're building some kind of tool or platform or something, because you need to make sure that things go forward. You need to compromise in the external developer experience in the beginning. But in the meanwhile, I'm building solutions so that, for example, if they use Insomnia, is there uh, some kind of tool to convert Insomnia settings directly to Postman, so that I can expose the Postman settings for the third-party developers in the future. 
but you need to accept something, limitations, and you can't get to the optimum uh, developer experience in the, in the, in the first months possible. That's basically it, and our platform is coming operational this year. Developer sandbox is already open. All the APIs are there. Go there. Everyone can use a, uh, create an account and start fiddling, fiddling, fiddling around with the data that's available in the sandbox already, and it's growing up all the time. Thank you.